There we go. Perfect. Uh, so this is the OGM check-in call for Thursday, September 24th, 2020. Um, thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm just going to lead off the check-ins today just because a couple things are on my mind. One of them is uh, Sunday night starts a virtual conference hosted out of Romania at unfinished.ro. Uh, a few of you have signed up for it. They've made the signups intentionally wordy uh, because historically this conference has been um, free to attend but apply to attend and they really wanted the attendees to be all in and it was held in sort of a, a really cool castle venue in Romania and Bucharest and uh, so they've preserved the sort of lengthy application even though in virtual conferences everybody kind of sort of skips in and skips out um, but they did that intentionally because they'd like pe participants to invest their time somewhat but if you mention OGM or my name in the who sent you they will automatically accept you into the event and then yesterday we had a walkthrough for their platform, which they're they're using a new platform. And in this in this day of in this time of pandemics and lockdown, some of you have probably used Hopin. At the EXO world, people used Hopin.to. Uh, there have been a bunch of other platforms. I'll put a link, in fact, to the platforms I've seen for large scale virtual events that are not held in Zooms. Uh, or that are wrapped around Zooms like Kiko Chat, like Lucas Chiaffi's Kiko Chat. Anyway, this one is a, a little company that's built something called Flow OS that is actually quite intriguing and pretty. And one of it, one of its features is, um, and I don't know that I have a screen cap. I should have at least done a screen cap yesterday. But um, one of its features is that on the left, it show you can slide in and see the ad agenda of the event, and you can kind of see time time going through the event, so that as you as you end up at things, you can choose where to go and what to do. They also have a, a map of what used to be the floor, uh, sort of a perspective view of the floor of the old venue. So they've preserved those names. So there's a place where you can go have meals. There's a place where you can go just meet and mingle. There's a main hall, other sorts of things. And that's how you kind of get around. Uh, they then have everybody's avatars are kind of in, the, in little uh, circular vignettes, but the vignettes, I believe, show up as people are sort of participating in conversations in an interesting way. Uh, and in fact, um, April just did a TED circle using a platform called Circles that was, I think, sort of in the same general genre of more in sort of more intimate kind of online platforms trying to make these things work well together. Um, and so if you go to flowos.com, you won't see very much. If you go to unfinished.flowos.com, that's where, <coughs> excuse me, the conference will be hosted but they're not you know, sending um, registrations until uh, over the weekend. I think it's, uh, the, thing, the thing opens up uh, over the weekend with some celebrations. And they're doing kind of, uh, by Romanian time, breakfast, lunch, and dinner sessions. That's how they're breaking up the days over a week. And so the dinner sessions match well to you know, West Coast time zone. So my, my speech is uh, 9 a.m. Pacific on Monday. That's when they're presenting my talk and then I do a live Q&A. Um, but it's a, uh, it's, it, the whole thing has been really kind of interesting and the people are young and super smart and I think they're not sleeping much right now. They haven't been sleeping much for a month, uh, building this thing up. So that's one thing that's kind of on my mind that I just want to report in on. Uh, the other thing that's on my mind, unfortunately, is that my, I, I got a call yesterday that my mom needs to move from assisted living to memory care. And any of you who have elders in care or anything like that, um, may understand some of those implications, but that hit me really hard because um, my mom still knows who I am and what's going on, but she's really losing, losing the program and uh, losing her memory as we sit here. Uh, thanks, Scott. Um, losing her memory and ability to use words as we sit here and talk about shared memory, collective sense making and all that. So the, this, there's ironies there and a bunch of stuff going on. And it also means, you know, what, what, what little stuff from my growing up is still kind of with mom and that has to get paired back even more and mom is not going to like the move, et cetera. So that's, that's weighing heavily on my, on my heart. Um, and with that, let's go around and sort of the usual method of going from the bottom up in my grid view, which means uh, Judy, Mark, and Mark. So uh, first Mark Thibault, then Mark Trexler. Uh, so Judy, if you wanna lead us off. Well, busy week. Um, seems like all of my nonprofit work is converging on timelines <laughs> that have consumed a fair bit of my energy. But my primary emphasis really is on virtual education. 
and including in that the unschooling principles. Um, and we've been working on that some in the breakout group with Charles and Lauren. Um, I found a bunch of resources from the American Chemical Society that had kind of stepped up to the plate and put together a lot of virtual stuff for K-12 um, with cartoons and very age appropriate things that I was pleasantly surprised to discover they'd done in the last six months. Um, so I've passed that on to the group and I'm still trying to understand the dynamics of um, efforts to include social development and emotional development in remote learning curricula. And it isn't a curricula per se, but it's a process. And I'm thinking that what we need are more pilot groups where children interact in subsets of a group rather than as a listener to a teacher. Um, but I'm not finding working models of those just yet. <laughs> working, and, working models for virtual life or working models in general? I'm not finding examples of it having been put to use with school aged children in a breakout room sort of mode. And I don't know exactly how you do creative play. Um, there's some, I found a link on your website and I, I don't have it in front of me. I'll come back with it later. Um, but it's a sort of a, an Italian system for children's learning. That, uh, sure. Reggio Emilia? Yeah. Yeah. And I can't tell whether that's really in good repute or not. Uh, um, I far as I know, yes. Okay, good. Um, because the, the person I'm working with at the White Bear Arts Center, who is our um, education and outreach director is involved with White Bear and White Bear actually is trying to implement social and emotional development. Um, but I don't know where they're starting. <laughs> so I'm trying on, I'm on a learning curve trying to find out what is happening that I can get my fingers on or not, not to manipulate, but to know what's actually happening at the working level mm -hmm. and then how to bring that back into the collective intelligence mode. Um, love that. And I think we probably have a lot of resources to help you here. And Lauren and Charles have been hosting conversations uh, on this topic. Uh, but anybody who wants to drop things in the chat, please do. Um, and I just posted a link to Reggio Emilia in my brain for you. <clears throat> and love, love that. We should come back to it because we need to do more on, on, on learning together. Well, there's, there's two pieces, I think. There's the actual process of learning and the enablement of education, not educate. I'm almost like not liking the word education these days, um, <laughs> but the, the inquisitive learning of children and adults, sort of lifelong learning is more what I'm after, but how do you uh, enable it at different ages of life for people who may or may not have been comfortable with it is a, a somewhat sociological issue. Um, but just also wanting to try to find things that I can use in the community not trying to reach too far, but get to working practices. There are, and there are insane um, amounts of content, community, material, everything, experts online. <clears throat> I haven't through, well, one of the amazing things to me through lockdown is how little of that has been organized nicely for, <clears throat> for use, for, for, for going through, for, for rethinking how we learn. Um, yeah. So more power to what you guys are doing in, in Kiko Lab, et cetera. Um, thank you, Judy, very much. That was much. a little long, I'm sorry. Um, but super interesting, and I think it has like lots of hooks into what we care about. Uh, Mark Thibault, then Mark Trexler, and then Hank. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Um, working on, um, I'm really sorry to hear that, um, Jerry. But you thank you. Um, I've been on that road before, it's variable. Um, yeah, I've been, I'm, I'm been working on forming a, a collective um, with the hope that um, bringing different talents together, people with experience in working on indigenous issues will get us um, a better sense of how to be more efficient in what we do. Um, so a lot of what we've been talking about here and, and also in the, um, Charles uh, um, gatherings about collective intelligence is, makes a lot of sense. So moving forward with that. 
Thank you, Mark. Thank you. One a really important thing on my way to list of important things is how to blend the best of the old with the best of the new. Yeah. Meaning, meaning how, do, how do we pick from the best of indigenous ways of knowing and marry them to the best of this like crazy, insane information environment we have, which has been hijacked by, by business models that are not helpful, but there, there's like 500 really good conversations there, but I think there's a lot to do in that space. So thank you. And that has been, and that has been my, um, the focus of the last eight years, I call it uh, intercultural regenerative systems. Inter... Intercultural. Intercultural. Regenerative systems. Regenerative systems, thank you. Yeah, uh, awesome. taking, taking from um, intercultural health models, which were the only ones that really look at that intercultural aspect. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, uh, Mark, Hank, Kevin. Uh, good morning. Um, I have to admit, I woke up at five this morning to a medium, a piece on medium laying out four plausible scenarios for U.S. civil war after the election. And can you, can you post it to the? I'll, I'll, I'll post it, and and it, and for me, it's just sort of a tipping point in terms of actually starting to take seriously these scenarios. Um, and so it, it's just sort of an overwhelming thought that I'm having trouble getting past. Um, last week was when I started hitting things like that, like the, the red mirage scenario and so forth. And I've been collecting them up, putting them in my brain, et cetera. They're, they're pretty, pretty frightening. So thank you, Mark. Um, Hank, Kevin, then Julian. Yeah, good morning, everybody. Um, I think I, so I've kind of been starting to dig, or not starting to dig, but I, I had a very similar kind of article pass in front of my face a couple of days ago, too, and I've been, you know, kind of digging into that, um, you know, otherwise, <coughs> still just reading about, you know, I think a lot of just like earlier kind of writings about how all the system is intended to work um, and the principles on which it's founded um, and in my private time, which has been, it's just been kind of interesting to, to try and marry, um, you know, where things started and, you know, where intentions can go. So um, that's kind of where I'm at. Thank you, Hank. Uh, Kevin, Julian, Pete. Uh, Kevin, you're muted. Alas. All right, there we go. Yeah, much better. Go. Hello, cool. can you hear me? Good. Yes. Yeah, you know, I've been working on a couple of projects. I mentioned the church-based uh, <clears throat> credit union and the local equity fund for small business preservation. And I realized I needed a peer group. So I formed one <laughs> called the Neighborhood Economics Cohort. We've got seven uh, folks uh, who are doing, you know, kind of an, inter uh, an economy of interconnectedness versus a, an economy of uh, rugged individualism. Uh, we're meeting for uh, our first uh, uh, every other week deep dive in, at 11.15 and then a weekly check-in tomorrow. And um, it's a lot of fun for me because I'm, I'm, I've, I have enough things to focus on that you know, a lot of times my energy kind of swamps a single project. So I, the portfolio it makes, makes it easier for the folks I'm working on since I'm working on six or seven other projects, uh, two of which I'm deeply engaged in. So anyway, I'm, 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 I'm having fun with it. I mean, my stuff works if, if the shit hits the fan better. So, you know, that's the stuff I'm building. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, do you want, are you intentionally keeping this group kind of small or do you want, is it open membership? Or would you like other people to join you? Yeah, if you are working on some project like that and that, are, that you have at least a group going together and you know what problem you're working on, um, yeah, you know, yes, I would, I would be glad to talk about it. So people should email you? Yeah, please email and, me. Uh, Kevin Doyle Jones at gmail.com. Kevin Doyle Jones one at gmail.com. One. Uh, Who else I, got the, the not one? Well, it was me, but I couldn't figure out how to get back. And I, and Are I've you kept it. kidding me? Well, yeah, but see, I, I've kept it because I've built software uh, successfully three times, but I build it for people like me who can't figure out Gmail. And that, that <laughs> one is a reminder of, of who I'm building for. <laughs> um, thank you very much. That was great. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's an iconic failure that travels it with every email. It's just a reminder. Perfect. Uh, so Julian, Pete, Lauren. Uh, well, now I have to wonder when is Kevin Jones 2 coming up? So. <laughs> As soon as he can't get into one. 
<laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. I, you know, I'll I'll ask my grandson. <laughs> So uh, I was going to say that uh, today's session had better be good because I was dreaming about playing, about to being able to play with a puppy when the alarm went off. So oh man, session I'm had sorry. better be good. All right. Um, I've mentioned that I'm working on a database of the ACM SIGGRAPH uh, litany for the from the last fifty years, and this week I imported the uh, the, ta the data tables that describe the art show that they've had for the last forty years. And this is part of my quest to treat this visual information in a visual way. Um, th this by import, I mean from their standard databases into Neo4j. So now I have a, a graph database of this material. And then now I can import that into my 3D visualizer. So, so forming a complete loop of visually managing visual information. And as I was doing this, I realized because there's semantic analysis being done, there are a lot of scientists who put art show who've made art show entries, and this is going to eventually lead to the semantic question, is it art? But I hope I don't have to deal with that part of it. Is it art is always one of these profound questions. Um, thank you, that's great. Uh, Pete, Lauren, Scott. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, been working on various stuff. Uh, one of the things is a, a project tracker for a project dashboard for a nonprofit I'm working with. <clears throat> and I kind of genericized it and I'm gonna write it up. And um, so it's, it's simple and small, but it's kind of cute. So uh, I'm looking forward to sharing that. Uh, the other thing I'm excited about right now, um, and I'm not sure exactly why, but it is, it, it, it came upon me. Um, uh, I got into Secure Scuttlebutt, um, uh, which is a distributed chat-ish system um, and I, I think anybody who's interested in decentralized systems uh, should be on on uh, secure scuttlebutt. So um, I will be sharing more about why and how uh, in I don't know in the next few days. That sounds great. Thank you. And I think the whole notion of distributed apps, distributed systems, secure distributed, all, you know, trustworthy distributed, all those things are really core to some of what we need under the hood here. So um, happy to learn more. And, and if you ever wanted to do like, a, a, if, if, if any subset of us wanted to do a briefing back to the group on that topic, that would be really useful, I think, for everybody. Um, Lauren Scott Joseph. There, now you're unmuted, except we can't hear you. No. Really? Now we hear you. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, so um, I'm uh, up to my years and family stuff and will be probably for the next uh, month or so. Um, but uh, after, after um, emerging from the fog of all these changes uh, that are going on in my uh, family household, um, uh, you know, uh, Charles and I have really uh, wanted to get super serious with the fundraising and um, we were thinking of using this concept we've been developing called um, uh, hash versus and hash ends to organize kind of a, a multi-group uh, fundraiser um, where we actually like um, try to coordinate getting grants and using our kind of multiple um, entities, um, whether those are nonprofits and the U.S., we have one uh, entities in Europe and organizing these different concepts that are floating around and ideas and projects and stuff like that. And because we we're going through a whole database of uh, U.S. nonprofit grants. Um, so we just think that by the time, you know, the, the amount of uh, energy it takes to go through the calendar and to do the process of um, kind of doing that for us. We could be doing that for other people as well. And we'd like to kind of uh, get together with the Europeans because uh, that's another pool of money that we could tap into for like Americans who don't have a European entity. So um, we're not gonna do that right away, but um, yeah, in a, in a month or so, we'd really like to um, uh, get a lot more serious with that and um, really start uh, writing a lot of grants and stuff like that. That's so. lovely. That's lovely. Thank you. One thing I discovered recently is that it's 
and, and it runs contrary to what I'd like to do with OGM, but it's re useful to have a 501c3 in the US because a lot of grants require that kind of structure for grant making, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I'm, I'm just wondering if people in, if people in OGM have a, a C3 that could be used as a, as a docking mechanism or as a host for this. Go ahead, Charles. That's us. <laughs> oh, okay. Love Evolve um, is a New York State 501c3. Oh, cool. I did not know that. Um, awesome. More on that. I mean, it, it may not only be us, but we, it's available as a vehicle. Yeah. Um, Scott, Charles, uh, sorry, Scott, Joseph, then Charles. Hey, everyone. A um, couple things. So, Jerry, I started to use your slash now as a, as a way to I keep a prioritized list of things I'm working on, but this I feel is more public. It's like, it's the public face of that. It's saying, okay, if anybody were to ask me, what am I working on now? Then that's, that's the list that I want to keep called because my list is too big and too scattered and too unfocused. But I'm, I'm finding that a useful thing to say, if someone were to ask me, this is the stuff I'm working on now, at least things I want to tell people. So that's, that's interesting. Uh, Judith, I put a couple of links in the chat for you. Uh, one was a book called Thinking at Every Desk, which I am a big fan of. Um, it's lots and lots of uh, real life examples of working with classrooms and teaching thinking skills to the students as, as early as kindergarten. So these are very, very simple concepts and they're finding that once they learn these skills, they can apply them to different and new subjects and use the same tools. Um, the second thing was about uh, design thinking breakout groups. So in the design thinking process, which is an empathy-based process, um, the, I, I put a little video in there that was the best example I found of a, of a woman who put together, this is how you organize a remote design thinking workshop. And there's a section in there about breakout groups, but it's just a, it's a nice piece overall. Um, but I think that that's, that's an area where, where they might be a few steps ahead of everyone else because their meetings are all collaborative and empathy based. And so that might be a useful resource. And that's, that's about it for me. Thank you so much, Scott. Um, uh, Kevin, quickly, you have your hand up. Yeah, <clears throat> on, on school, we've got a couple uh, homeschooling pods uh, around our farm uh, on and next. I was talking to my 14-year-old uh, grandson about how it went <clears throat> or how it's gone. And, and he said, you know, uh, Karen, he just said, yeah, but, you know, there's a lot of different parents around at different times now that are doing things. And that was just an interesting comment that parents are like... <clears throat> the parent who's good at math is suddenly jumping in along with the teacher and stuff like that. It's, it's just a, it's a different, it just seemed to be, a, it, that's it. It feels a little bit like blending the best of the old and the best of the new. Um, so we have Joseph Charles Stacy. Hi. Um, so the thing that's most, uh, that I've been most working on lately is uh, this pure Gaji handbook version four. <clears throat> proposal for a fellowship at New York Public Library and I've been sending out different drafts of that for comments. I haven't gotten that many comments back, uh, but I've gotten some interesting discussions going in parallel about just kind of what is Piragaji, how does it work, <clears throat> and that's been helpful. Um, I did get some comments back from a friend of mine who's got a book coming out uh, with Bristol University Press on something like Trump and Spectacle, uh, which I can find the link to put in the chat that mm. might be interested for, interesting for the people who here are big fans of Donald Trump and all related topics. Um, so um, yeah, I wanted to come along to this meeting just to see how you guys do it. Uh, and I was particularly attracted to the theme of bootstrapping um, that Jerry put in there. Um, interested to see how you guys are looking at that. And the reason I'm interested in it is I guess for those who don't know me, I was at a startup incubator for like six months earlier this year uh, and left without pitching for money, uh, pitching for VC funding, and with the strong advice that I should go off and bootstrap my startup. And so I'm now learning that that's like a thing and that some of the people I know maybe know something about that. So um, I'm interested in understanding how to bootstrap in a kind of Engelbartian informed way 
beyond just skimming some of his web pages. So if people have comments and thoughts on that, I'm here to learn about that. Um, just like the state of the art in my little startup is we had at one point decided for some arbitrary reason to do three meetings a week. Um, and we've essentially just decided to go back to one meeting a week kind of on the view that we don't have that much time given we're all volunteers. We shouldn't spend that much time in meetings. And I guess that, that provokes a kind of meta question for the people here, which is, uh, yeah, are meetings a good use of time in general? And when are meetings a good use of time given that we're in one right now? Um, but yeah, that, that's probably enough. I could uh, probably find a way to circulate this latest Peer Guide to Handbook version four proposal publicly. Well, it's just the PDF. I could put it in put it in the chat. So if anyone wants to read it and comment, those who are interested in education, I guess one of my questions about that is, is this actually relevant for right now or is it just kind of not? I'm, I'm proposing to do some remixes with public domain materials. So in principle, it's no more relevant now than it ever has been, but maybe maybe that's not a bad thing. So I'll um, put the PDF in the chat and then my email address for front end. Quick question, Joe. Does that include specifically pedagogy for children? Uh, I think I mention it based on our latest interactions in the Kiko lab thing. I mention it as a as a use case, but I'm not planning um, in this fellowship to deliver that. And the other comment to make is it's for a fellowship that starts September 2021. So in any case, um, whatever happens before then will all be kind of groundwork for this fellowship. Uh, but I do mention that as, as a kind of one of the motivating things for the revisions that we're Thank you. working on. Thank you. And just um, just to pin this for the bootstrap conversation, let's talk about pedagogy handbook plus bootstrapping as a part of that conversation. So let's 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 bring that in. Um, Charles Stacy Klaus. Hello, everyone from Zurich. It's a bit overcast, um, but still pleasant temperatures. Um, Jerry, just wanted to mention. Um, also, sorry to hear about your mom and uh, my dad, um, his whole career is as a kind of expert researcher in, in dementia and Alzheimer's and has for the last few years also been stuck in himself. So I can mm. have some different perspectives on all that. Um, certainly uh, compassion. Um, lots of emotions are heating up these days all around and um, I sort of found myself in a in a mild storm in regard to like cross pollinating and trying to um, do the network weaving and stuff with uh, with newsletters from a couple of, of, of uh, groups and um, it's it's actually been really great to kind of open up the discourse. Um, but there's, you know, so much potential around collaboration, sort of communication collaboration and, and a lot of contraindications as well. Um, <laughs> um, in other news, I did some deep diving in my in my maps and repositories and folders um, even last night, and just finding incredible stuff that, that is so rich for um, for us here and and, and uh, what I start to call I don't know if this will stick, but sister circles. I, I did a little mini map of sister circles, just kind of the immediate ones that I'm part of and even co you know co-founder of, and it's already kind of overflowing. So just trying to grab some sense out of that. Um, another wonderful thing that some of us here caught um, the other night was an uh, interview with Audrey Tang um, from Harvard that was just amazing. I have the auto transcript that, um, there's a few links I'm gonna, I'm gonna share when I just get my hands on them. Um, and that's probably plenty for now. I think we, we continue with our Monday sessions and, um, yeah, everyone's welcome. It's great to be here. Thank you very much, Charles. Love that. Uh, Stacy Klaus Doug. Well, like Mark and Hank, I've been pretty consumed with the upcoming election and what might happen after. And uh, bas basically, most of what I do is on Facebook. And I laughed when Scott was speaking because I feel like I'm trying to teach thinking skills and empathy in the Facebook groups and trying to inject a virus of understanding. Um, it's actually been kind of successful. And um, I'm really looking to see if there's anybody that's interested in a few last minute things that I think can be done, easy, simple things. And that process would also work towards a big, bigger project that I'm working towards 
which I'll talk about next week, but this would be like the test case to see how that would go. So if anybody's interested, let me know. Super interested. Yeah, that sounds great. Thank you, Stacy. Um, Klaus dug the nut. Yeah, it has been uh, a really busy week. Finally, <clears throat> after working on this for years, the, the, this whole idea of regenerative agriculture is really catching on. Um, there, there are incredible webinars and, and uh, activities uh, just across the spectrum that focus on it. And I got green-lighted by Citizen Climate Lobby, uh, combination business climate leader, to run a national campaign uh, addressing farmers to um, promote the bills called the Growing Climate Solutions Act, which is a bipartisan bill that is essentially designed to pay farmers to shift their practices towards regenerative organic. Um, and then the money would uh, come through carbon markets. Uh, it's a blockchain-based method of uh, creating certifications for carbon sequestered into the soil and the farmer then gets paid on a per ton basis. Um, it's amazingly advanced already, but it's sort of time critical before the election because these farmers uh, are in a real pickle right now. On the one hand, um, they don't want uh, the regulations or government to get into their way to uh, uh, be told how to farm and what to do. On the other hand, they realize that uh, what they're doing right now is pretty catastrophic. You know, they're losing their topsoil. Um, they're losing their farms, basically. Uh, the, the damage this year, you know, through climate events, uh, from fires to flooding to storms, uh, wind, wind storms and so on, is just really significant and no one is tracking it. But there are several states, I mean, Colorado lost significant shares of their crops before they could bring them in through a snowstorm in August. So it, it's, uh, it, it is really uh, amazing and, and it's throughout the globe. It's Australia, you know, it's, it's, it's Europe, it's everywhere. So I've been, uh, I have a, a team together, but when I mean, you're working with volunteer groups, everything is like crawling in slow motion. <laughs> and I need to get materials together that allow us to uh, do mass uh, mailing, you know, the emailing to uh, farm bureaus, you know, the farmers and so on to, to explain this, uh, this act and the information around it. Um, so, and, I, and I, I, we have 180,000 volunteers throughout the United States who all have training as uh, lobbyists, right? I mean, our volunteers are being trained how to talk to members of Congress. Um, so I, I sent Jerry a note, but I mean, if anybody feels inspired, because I don't have these skills, you know, to, I, I can do a PowerPoint sort of, but uh, I, I don't have the skills to put presentation materials together or really uh, uh, compelling uh, uh, messages, you know, to, to summarize this. Anyway, I think before, the, I think, I mean, the elections are obviously, this is a very frightening moment. I mean, I was born in Germany and I said from six months before the election in 2016, I said six months before, this, this smells really bad. You know, I mean, this is, this, there are some very familiar undertones here that uh, I can relate to. I was born in 1949, you know, and, and I got really uh, inadvertently um, more familiar with what happened in the 30s in Germany than, uh, than you really need to know. <laughs> but. Um, we're right there, you know, this is, this is a really bad moment. And these farmers are critical. You know? um, I mean, Trump is now pumping uh, billions of dollars into the farm sector, but it's a waste of money, right? Because th these farmers should be incentivized to do the right thing. Uh, but you have you know, the same dynamics in the food system that you have in the energy sector. You know, you have legacy systems that depend on agriculture doing what they're doing right now and, and shifting into a regenerative process where you're working uh, with the soil, you know, to restore and regenerate the soil means that you have to change your crop types, your cycles, your seeds and so on. And the entire supply chain uh, uh, is going to fall apart in that process. You know, it has to be reconfigured. So anyway, um, I, I have a team of volunteers, you know, within the 
CCL community. I mean, they're all very smart people and, and, and scientists and farmers and so on, but we don't have that skill set you know, to, to short term you know, to put it together. I mean, we can, but it takes two or three months to really to get it done. Um, and Klaus, uh, I'd love to put your question about how to, how to make this really punch uh, in front of the whole OGM group. So let's, 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 um, let's turn that into a, a group project and see who'd like to show up and help do that. I, I know that I'd love to, to help do that. I've just been a little distracted. Um, along the same lines, uh, my mom, who I just mentioned at the, at the top of the call, was born in Berlin in 1934. Uh, and they escaped Germany in 39, just before shit hit fan on one of the last steamships out of Hamburg. And, and she grew up in South America. And I lived the first 12 years of my life in South America as a, as a result, because my dad, who was a Polish-American kid from Milwaukee, uh, ended up in South America because he loved engineering and loved adventure travel. Um, and I just finished watching the last season, the most recent season of Babylon Berlin, and I speak German as, uh, as a result of all that. Um, I highly recommend Babylon Berlin because you can see Nazism's rise in as part of a detective story that's an international mystery that's a really well cast, well scripted, well acted, well set uh, period piece about sort of what, what's happening in Germany in that, in that era. Um, and I was just stunned at how good it was. Um, so we'll, we'll come back to that. Uh, Doug, then Matt. Okay, uh, let's see. Rob Johnson, who's president of the Institute for New Economic Thinking, where I do some consulting, did a pod chat with me, podcast with me last week that's posted. It's, I put it up in the early part of the chat. Uh, it's a pretty good overview of the way I think about a lot of things. And the issue really in the Institute is how you get economics ch changing, not one variable at a time, which is the standard approach and impossible, but systemically by shifting the worldview. Uh, it's a very interesting task. And I'm very influenced by Bruno Latour's approach to that. Uh, and some of that's reflected in the pod chat. Uh, what's m most on my mind is the potential violence around the election. And how much is this a creation of the spectacle, Guy Debord's idea, uh, and it's not real, uh, and we're being manipulated for our clicks, but it sure feels real. Uh, and it puts me in a dilemma as to how to handle it. Uh, do I try and keep myself really super informed on all the details, in which case I'm doing a lot of clicks and, and helping out those companies? Um, so I'm just puzzled but I certainly am deeply concerned. I mean, if, if Trump is to act really badly, where is the, the core group that could counter that? Where does the leadership come from? And I can't see it yet. Those are my thoughts. Thank you. Um, we'll come back to that too. Uh, so, sorry, and I, I forgot that Rob had joined us a, a little bit in the call. So Rob, then Matt. Great, thank you. Um, so this week, um, well, I'm in a entrepreneur group in Washington, D.C., and they had an event with Rob Bell, who is uh, kind of a spiritual, um, spiritual, maybe some somewhat Christian. Uh, I'm not 100% sure of his total background. Um, but an interesting question that kicked off a, a breakout group was not where do you come from, but who do you come from? Um, which is a great question and, you know, thinking about who are the people that shaped your upbringing and your grandparents and potentially even further back. Um, and then from that, how did you become who you are? Um, so I thought those were great uh, uh, questions that, that drove some good discussion. Another part of the discussion, he was talking about the, the universe and you know, 13 billion years ago, we came from a, a black hole and, and a big bang and there was particles. And then after several billion years, particles started connecting and became atoms. And after another couple billion years, atoms started connecting to make molecules and molecules made cells and cells made life and so forth. But that the, the pattern in the universe is expansion and moving forward and you know and and where our 
systems are inhibiting that forward movement, there, there is a force to, to change those systems. So it was somewhat of an optimistic note among all the, the chaos that, um, you know, that, that the, the, the life force in the universe is pushing us forward and that, and towards connecting. Um, so that, that was an interesting pattern. Um, relative to my, my work, we're putting on an event in the next couple of months around human trafficking. Um, some of our work is around um, law enforcement and nonprofits countering human trafficking, and we've had events in the past. Um, so Scott, I appreciate the link around design thinking um, used for breakouts. Uh, we're definitely into design thinking and that, so I'm sure that, that, uh, that note will hit home. So I'm looking into uh, platforms for hosting those meetings. Uh, Teams and Zoom are obvious ones. There's one called Hop In that I've been looking at. So if anyone has other platforms like that that are kind of well produced and support breakouts and things like that, um, we may go with Zoom or we may may look at other ones. Um, but those are some of the things that I'm up to. Thank you. And I'm going to put that a link to uh, virtual event platforms in my brain. So hop in and a bunch of others and circles and flow OS. <clears throat> the ones that we mentioned here are, are at that, at that yep. node. Uh, so you can look. I, I don't know why I didn't go there first, Jerry. Well, that's all right. Nobody, <laughs> no, almost nobody's got that habit. Um, Matt. Um, hey, everyone. It's uh, been uh, uh, in, an interesting week. And there's a couple of sort of things that I'd uh, love to put out there. One is, I don't know if anyone has um, ever seen the Farnham Street books. Um, Farnham Street, it was started by a gentleman who was a analyst with uh, the Canadian um, uh, sort of version of the CIA and has tried to create a set of volumes. He's on, I think, volume two and working on them are, are sort of these uh, great mental models. These are the mental models that everyone should be um, using and I just think that there's something interesting there that um, and so I've been thinking a lot about mental models I'm thinking a lot about uh, change um, Rob one of the things that I have to find the link but I think it's I think it's called the uh, the world history project um, that talks about the sweep of all history and history doesn't just um, come together the way that you described it it actually um, deteriorates to a point that it then um, goes through this sort of threshold moment where it becomes a higher state. And so you have this interesting, um, you know, sort of balance of entropy and um, things moving to zero and then something emerging out of it. And um, is that kind of what we're, what we're doing right now as a, as a civilization? Um, and, um, you know, the other thing that I've been thinking about is I, based on this group, um, some of the stuff, Doug, that you've been putting out there um, with Latour and, um, and also the indigenous knowledge of uh, started reading low tech, um, which I find to be fascinating. Um, you know, it makes me wonder, though, about um, population and have, have we become so dependent on our systems to sustain the level of population that we have and are those indigenous models really require sort of, um, you know, require um, its own version of breakdown um, in order to be able to get back to, you know, back to those things. Um, and then the last thing I just want to put out there is, um, Klaus, I'm happy to help with the communication stuff. I know, um, you know, a couple other people on this call also mentioned that they'd be happy to help. Um, we have a podcast called Talking Machines. Um, it's about artificial intelligence. I'm wondering if we don't start a podcast, you know, called Talking Food. Um, and we just started, um, you can co-host it and we start an interview process with all these people and we get that going as well as some of the, the more practical PowerPoint um, things, but I would be happy to, you know, support, um, support starting up that show. Um, I also think that I'm working right now trying to find 
sponsorship for a website um, that we're calling um, No Injustice, um, kind of a play on words. It's K N O W, but um, No Injustice. Um, Dot org is what we're thinking about getting and um, trying to get some heavy hitting sponsorships where we actually um, visually um, and through narrative describe the history of injustice and how we got to where we are. But I'm wondering if that also doesn't, that we also don't expand that platform to talk about the food system, right? Um, talk about the climate system and connect to the climate web. But I, I'm wondering if some of the work of this group can't be to build our own version of almost like a micro a micro web of content that all goes through a single a single portal of you know single place where you can do your search you can do your thing but you avoid all of the marketing i mean even my like i said last week even my daughter says that when she googles something for school she has to work through a thousand ads Right. I think she, you know, you know, Googled some some word term and there was a consulting company that had used that word and they were the first one. And then there was, you know, some other company that had named their product that same word. And, you know, this is a 13 year old girl trying to do a research project. Um, I just think that the Web is has been corrupted and, um, you know, by these, um, you know, this virus called um, sell me something. Um, so. That's, that's what's been on my mind and um, happy to connect with people offline. Oh, the last thing I'll say is Kevin and I, um, you know, got a meeting with um, an organization that I work with um, and I was somewhat disappointed in the, uh, the state of that meeting because the reality and Doug, I, I'd love to pick your brain here is that these companies that are um, running our economic systems, um, are so dependent on um, the system itself being maintained, and um, it's not a, it's not, it's not coming from a place of maybe evilness the same way that I think um, you know other people who are corrupting our our systems are. It's coming from a place of sort of that worldview and the survival models and the perpetuation of what they think is good for you know all of the people who they're employed you know that they employ all of the people that they serve um they just can't see their way out of it and i think doug your comment about the path has to be systemic and it has to be illuminated for everyone to know that there's a there there um that's safe and um comfortable and um better than what we have otherwise people are just going to resist change um, without either breakdown or, you know, something. So we, we need to show the enlightenment. Otherwise, we're going to experience the breakdown. Yeah. Um, Klaus, I know you raised your hand, so. Yeah, so did, so did <coughs> yeah, Julian. So let's go Klaus, then Julian. Sorry. Yeah, Matt, I mean, it, it, it does make, make a lot of sense intuitively. So, so the farmers for, uh, in, in, in uh, the U.S. Or, and everywhere, really, um, don't see a path forward with how they can make money and how they can get paid for these changes that are so necessary. Um, and to, to send out a message saying, look, we're with you, you know, we got you, uh, we're, fi we're going to figure this out collectively, but we have to go and change. I think that's sort of the message they are really waiting for you know, because they, they, they see what is happening. And so the idea that uh, Trump right now is pushing billions of dollars into the farm sector, basically paying people for not farming, right? I mean, uh, for getting their crop demolished or, or uh, getting prices that are lower than, than uh, uh, their, their production costs, that doesn't help anybody. No, so, but, and the farmers know that. So, so to, to, it's actually a very simple message to, to, uh, to put into the market because everybody knows it, right? It just needs to be said. It, it is not being voiced. And it's that's... Not, I, 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 I'm, I'm wondering about that, that it, I, I think you're right, it needs to be said and people intuitively get it. Like, so we're running these strategy sessions for General Mills, right? I find General Mills to be in some ways um, uh, 
uh, emotionally speaking, as, a, as part of the problem, right? But we're talking about a very large organization that is dependent on, um, uh, from, from its own, if you look at the world from its systemic, from its vantage point, right? If it was General Mills was you as a human being, the choices that you make and would have to make are actually, they're bad choices, right? You've built a system of, you know, squeezing farmers and paying them less than, you know, what the crop is, what they have to pay for the crop. You're dependent on the flow of sugar through your system. You need car, you know, you need sort of these Cargill driven mass manufactured farms. You need to, you know, market to, um, low income people with sugar, like all of these, all of these things are built into the system. And it's not that they don't need to change. And it's not that the people inside that system don't, I can tell that they feel that need to change. What they don't know is how do you take, you know, a billion dollars and transfer it into another thing that feeds and sustains that whole system that everybody's dependent on. And I think it's, even, even my company, Collective Next, is supporting companies like that because that's the only way that, you know, that's the only way we've discovered right now to make the kind of resources and funds to be able to do the kind of work that we do want to do. And I think you're, we're in this, stuck in this, we're all stuck in the same game of dependent on the market going up, dependent on, you know, products being sold more. And I think that, that systemic dependence is, it's not just awareness, it's, it's, it's what's on the other side. Um, yeah. And I don't know if people can even see and imagine what's on the other side, and that scares me, right? The, 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 the industry is stuck. I was in a webinar yeah. this week with uh, the Soil Health Institute, a group of, of amazing scientists, amazing people, uh, talking about everything that needs to be done to restore soil, sequester carbon out of the atmosphere into the soil. So about halfway through, uh, I asked uh, the question uh, and it got upvoted, so they had to respond to it, um, asking, is the industry, the supply chain ready you know, to deal with these changes that the farmer will have to make in order to re regenerate his soil? And there was like, no one wanted to touch it. I mean, the entire panel was like, this is too hot to talk about. You now, and some, I, one, one guy picked it and he talked it away. But that's really the challenge. You know, you can't move until the industry uh, uh, embraces it and they don't. And then they're radically opposed to it. Yeah. Um, right. Julian, yeah. uh, Julian, and then a question for the group on this topic. Go ahead, Julian. Oh, I thought since we uh, had hit the halfway point, we're talking about Google searches, I'd bit, inject a bit of wry humor. A good friend of mine has this hobby of looking for search phrases that will return exactly one Google result. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Wasn't that called Google bombing? I have, I have two of those that I created. So yes, that's Google whacking. Google whacking, thank you. Google whack. Yeah, I, I knew it had a, I, I knew there was a term for this. Like, <laughs> thank you, thanks Joe. Um, and, and a question I think for Kevin and others, um, which is one of the things that struck me years ago was that there's a, like a three year period where farms have to certify as organic and most farmers can't, can't finance their way through the three year period. So other financial instruments, and, and that's just an old and, and specific example, but I'm sure that right now moving toward regenerative ag is a very similar kind of path. Um, are there financial instruments that exist already or that need to be invented to bridge people uh, into new forms of production. Because part of the problem, I think, um, that Klaus has framed is that people can't see a safe way across the river. So, so they're not going to try. They're going to they're stick to the, the lousy, dangerous, and unprofitable current method because otherwise they may die because they can't see a way to, to actually change. Or, or maybe what we, or what we have to do is we actually have to build communities around these regenerative farms. And I don't know if there are indigenous lands or indigenous peoples that we want to actually take the food system out of the hands of the capitalist system, you know, move it into, into large scale community-based farms. Um, you know, I imagine, I grew up in Wisconsin, I imagine what if all that farmland, um, you know, was put to use for 
you know, a bunch of people who then moved, moved there. And, you know, we kind of get back to, you know, these localized things. We take out the globalized supply chain and you actually have to move closer to the, the food if you want healthy, you know, healthy and sustainable, you know, crops. The farmers just revolt. They start feeding themselves. They start housing themselves, you know, and maybe that's the, you know, you know, take the ball and go home versus try to play in a system that just basically is, you know, squeeze them to death. Um, and I'm wondering about that, just, you know, stepping away from the system is the right way to change the system, right? Uh, Create Kevin, something on the side. Yeah, Kevin, go ahead. What we did at Regenerate Illinois is help them move from farm to table regenerative to farm to hospital food system. Mm. And we got a hospital in Peoria, Illinois, I've been up to uh, go with oatmeal on a regenerative basis that, because it's a bulk thing and it's anyway it's a thing you could do you could do groundbreaking you could do oatmeal and now there are five hospitals in that trial uh, so an anchor customer who can pay the cost to do it in bulk is, is rather than funding it seemed to be there are several regenerative funds and they're trying and it's working in forestry more than it is in other things for some and reason. and i'd like i'd like us to stop the dive on food for a second to come back to the bootstrapping question because I think we can apply the bootstrapping question back to food in a second. Uh, but I'd love to use the chat and the conversation just uh, to ask you all, uh, what do you think bootstrapping means in the context of OGM? So type it into the chat. So uh, will somebody type that question into the chat in all caps <clears throat> so that we can see it easily in the, in the transcript? What, do, what does bootstrapping mean in the context of OGM? Um, and then uh, raise your hands or have a go at, at here and then also type it. Uh, thanks. Thank you, Joe. And then um, let's have a go at defining it um, ourselves. Kevin, go ahead. Uh, you're muted. Uh, you're I wasn't saying. Oh, okay. Saying. I, I, you were holding your finger in front of the lens. I interpreted that as a... Um, so uh, let me just start. Uh, one of them is like um, the idea of startups bootstrapping in Silicon Valley. And, <clears throat> and uh, that, that, that whole path is tinged to me with sort of melancholy irony and danger <clears throat> because I've ended up believing that the Silicon Valley startup model is an exit strategy, eat the world, winner takes all kind of model. And I think it, <clears throat> there's, there's just tons of people around the world trying to encourage entrepreneurship and their role model is sort of Facebook and Airbnb and whoever and, and sort of businesses that eat their spaces. Um, and I'm unclear that that's good for the earth. Uh, I think it's maybe better for the earth than large single-minded corporations that eat the world like ADM or Monsanto, <clears throat> but I don't know how much better. So, so that, that is completely one framing for bootstrap and there's a whole lot of literature around bootstrapping yourself into a startup and getting funding and all of that. So I, I kind of don't mean that very much. There's another completely different intention of bootstrapping, which comes from Doug Engelbart, which I will only be able to speak of superficially, <clears throat> but the idea that, that hum humans can bootstrap by, by sort of leveraging what they know and moving up into knowing more together. Uh, his original system was called the Augment Online System or something like that. Uh, he, was, he was really interested in augmenting human capacity as a, as a team. And I think that, that, that the place I'm coming at bootstrapping uh, uh, from is much more aligned with what Engelbart was looking for. <clears throat> and Engelbart's vision got waylaid for a variety of different reasons we could sort of diagnose if we want. But I think that that general notion about how do we help each other make better decisions is, is sort of in OGM's DNA for sure. And then there are other kinds of, of thoughts about what bootstrapping might mean. And, and, and also an important part of bootstrapping is creating a sustainable model of some sort. And we've talked, it, it's come up several times just in our check-ins here about, well, this is, a, we're, you know, I'm, I'm creating a volunteer effort. I've got a circle of people who are just donating their time. It's hard to wrangle. Uh, many of us would love to make a living doing what we're passionate about. So that would be pretty cool. Um, so I think there, there's a, a whole mix of things there. And I see that the chat is going crazy and I need to pay attention to it. Uh, but who would like to jump in and uh, take the floor? Uh, Joe, please go ahead. Um, so I can tell you what it happened yesterday in this interesting conversation. As I mentioned, I just exited recently a startup incubator. And uh, one of the best things that happened in that was that I kind of assembled a bunch of friends 
So you can imagine the kind of Joe's brain, I guess, group of all the people that I've gotten to know over the last, you know, 10 or 20 years or whatever kind of uh, uh, coalition of the willing sort of group who have been meeting, we called them the Friday group during the startup incubator. And then as it happened, my, my partner, who I found inside this incubator stopped coming to these meetings, which is a pretty strong signal that it wasn't going to work out with him because my vision was that this group we kind of form this sort of um, what would you a brain trust like in the in the words of the Pixar guy you know that they'd kind of maybe become advisors maybe become first hires once we got some money and then we kind of shape things and move it all so that didn't happen uh, for various reasons but they still existed so yeah so we decided why don't we all like research most of us have PhDs um, you know, why don't we just keep talking and it'll be kind of a cross between a seminar and a company and we'll kind of be a little bit more market focused or business focused than we would be in an academic seminar. It'll be like a R and D, it will become an R and D seminar inspired by something like 3M or whatever, but in a small context. And maybe we'll produce some customer facing things. Maybe we'll produce like some blog posts rather than some actual products and get them out there and see if anyone responds to any of this. So, okay, that's the context, just one or two more sentences to set up how it progressed yesterday. Yesterday we were thinking, um, what were the risks? The risks, some different people raised kind of different views on risks. And I do think risks are really important for this. Um, some, some risks uh, were that we wouldn't all be going in the same direction. Some people thought this is a bad risk. Some people said that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if we go in four different directions as long as we get results. So for that person, that wasn't the risk. The risk was not getting enough results. And then the first person kind of said, went back, you know, maybe the risk is rather that we can't communicate with each other and that we go in different directions and we're not able to kind of share the process. So the real, the real risk is that we don't have a shared process. Uh, and I thought all of those answers were interesting. So that there, in the end, there wasn't a conclusion. The only conclusion was um, that we would meet less frequently than three times a week and use some of our time to actually get some work done, maybe in small two-person teams, smaller uh, scrum-like meetings rather than big group meetings. So I submit that that's where it's at right now. Um, Joe, thank you very much. That's great. Um, Scott? All right. Um, so for me, bootstrapping, I go back to the root, which is basically getting yourself out of a situation by pulling your boots on, you know, grab the bootstraps and, and this is what you have. You pull it and you just go. Um, so uh, Rob, I think you had something that said something about your interest into design thinking as well. So the book is Sprint. Um, it was written by Jake Knapp and he started the Google Ventures, which is a bunch of little startups. And in five days, they teach you how to do the design thinking process. It's a five day process. But the reason I say this is that uh, steps four and five are build a realistic prototype and then test it with your target customers. And the, the, the point of all of this is that they, they build it in the least possible technical way. They make it as simple as possible, as fast, as cheap as possible. What do I need to be able to test this chair? Well, Let's, how about, let's start with a box, a couple of boxes, and then we'll put it on a couple of pieces of wood. Is that about the right height? Do I need to go to the wood shop and actually make a finished one and stain it and finish it? No, I'm just testing the height. Okay, we'll find something at that height. And the, the point of this is that you, instead of having months and months of talking together about what we should do as a big program, you, you do, here's one thing, here's one thing, let's try it. I think, Joseph, you mentioned that. You put out a blog post, you see what happens. Or you put out a comment that's smaller than a blog post and you see what happens. And you use that real world, world feedback to guide you, but don't get hung up on making, I can't test until I have a perfect prototype idea because you're always wrong. You're not, you're not your user. You give it to the user, you see what the user says and you adjust from there. So I found that to be a really accessible resource, that book. Um, and Scott, you're reminding me that there's a, <clears throat> a whole ec ecosystem, a whole community, including certification and projects called Exponential Organizations that were built out of a book that Salim Ismail co-authored, um, book, a book titled Exponential Organizations that is just coming out in its version two. And I was part of that 
whole activity in 2018 for quite a bit. And they have, they do 10 week sprints for corporations, which incorporate everything you just described. And by week five, the teams are busy pitching something often to the CEO of their company. Um, there's, I can, I can say a whole lot more about the process and what, what's going on there. But the idea of getting quickly to something that somebody can react to is super interesting. And Pete told us a story, I think here in this setting, maybe some other setting about having pitched uh, an idea to a venture capitalist who said, you're too far along in this idea. Um, what you really need to do is run three or four ads for different variants of the idea on Facebook and then figure out which one has traction and then build that thing. Um, Pete, did I, did I just mangle your story? Okay. <clears throat> Um, so, so, and then, and then I have this belief that, that uh, sometimes people just don't know what they want. So a really quick prototype won't actually get there because it's not usable enough. It doesn't actually sort of tangibly affect their lives. They can't use it well enough to groove it. I mean, before Steve Jobs premiered the iPhone in 2007, I was studying all of the technologies that are component parts of the iPhone. I did not imagine a slab of an obtainium that could, that didn't really have buttons. It has like three, four buttons, but didn't really have buttons on it and could become kind of anything with a beautiful color touch sensitive screen. I had looked at pen computing. I had looked at all different kinds of things, but, <clears throat> but the notion, and, and, and now it's very hard for all of us to unsee the smartphone and very hard for many of us to imagine life, what life was like before you had a GPS that meant that there was an interactive map for free on the same device that had a high definition video camera, et cetera, et cetera. So, so anyway, so the, 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 the sprint model doesn't often, I think, generate those kinds of ideas. Um, other, um, other thoughts on bootstrapping and what it might mean in our context. Um, uh, just real no. quick, oh, I'll just jump, this is a real quick one, Go ahead, uh, what Scott. you just said, Jerry. So if you ask people what, you, what they want, I think you're right. They can't describe it necessarily, always. If you show them one thing and say, do you like this, that it's still, it's better, but it's not great. If you show anybody two things, they will always be able to go, oh, that one. This one's not better. That one. And if you just, you know, if you show them 10 things, it's the same problem again. Uh, uh, but if you just make it, well, an original, you know, the original Facebook, for better or worse, probably worse, was a choice of this person or that person. And you chose one or the other. And then it was, that was the original model, at least reflected in the film. So I think there's value in saying, here, these two things, which one do you think? And then you just keep going down that road. Um, you just reminded me that Christopher Alexander in his thick four-part series, The Nature of Order, starts with what, like, what is beauty? And he proposes that there's general agreement on what beauty is, because if you show people two things, uh, on, on the whole, people will point to the more beautiful thing consistently across cultures, across whatever, <clears throat> so that there's some essence of beauty that sort of fits there. And then the other thing that you just, just triggered that I didn't have time to type in was the tyranny of choice, uh, which is Barry Schwartzman, I think, uh, or Barry Schwartz, who's busy saying like in, in grocery stores where they showed three samples, <clears throat> they had a table with three samples and a table with 23 samples. Many more people tried things from the table with 23 samples. Many more people bought things from the table with three samples. Charles, over to you. I uh, just wanted to go back to your question, which was put in a particular way, which kind of made me think in, in basically two ways, a meta view and, and a kind of micro hyper local view. Um, what does bootstrapping mean in the context of OGM? What does OGM mean in the context of OGM? So OGM is not one thing. Uh, I managed earlier today <laughs> for sort of the second time since it launched to, to jump in slightly to the discourse, the OGM discourse. And I found a few threads and I, I interacted a little bit. Um, it's clear that there's a lot of different different things happening in different people and groups and projects and, and, and solutions and, and all kinds of stuff, conversations. Um, um, and so in the meta sense, you know, bootstrapping in context of OGM is like getting all that together. And this phrase that I've been percolating for a while and started to, to use again uh, just, just now is uh, get it together to get together. Um, and I think that's, that's scalable kind of up and down um, between the meta and the, and the mini levels. So bootstrapping to me is like getting it together 
to get to really get together to get the collaboration going. And and to play off that, um, I say I also typed into the chat. There's so much, there's network of networks, communities of communities, circles of circles. There are just lots and lots of groups like this starting up all over the place with people who have an idea, know a lot of smart people, collect them up and say, let's go do this. Let, let let's make a movie. Back in the Judy Garland and uh, oh, what was his name? Mickey Rooney days. <clears throat> anybody who knows like old movies, there was a whole series during the depression where, where the, the punchline was, let's make it, let's put on a show. Um, and so we're doing that over and over again. Some of these are just nice conversations. They become salons and then they die out. Some of them turn into companies and go off and do things. Um, and some of them get really good at a particular thing. And I think part of what needs to happen is sort of this organic evolution of the communication across these networks so that we can learn from each other, so that we can connect up and help each other get things done, so that we can develop good models and just adopt the next, the next community's model. Because if you're trying to build, for example, an innovative business model for doing this, you're going to be inventing from scratch, right? And we don't need to. We should learn from, from the best of people who've gone before. So how, how do we do that? And then, and then I think over time, these communities will kind of form a, a, a gradient or a landscape or a terrain of interlinked communities where they will kind of be separate or distant in the landscape depending on some of their ethical, philosophical, political leanings where there will be the deeply, you know, startup culture, entrepreneurial, go, go, go kind of corner of this. And some of that knowledge will bleed off into other, other communities, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I just would, would like to add, you know, I think Please. that the, deta the details do matter in terms of, I mean, it's easier to, to kind of touch and feel and, and point to and talk about the, on the, the individual entity level, like in Kiko Lab, for example, or trying to cross pollinate between a few uh, groups like here and, and Medicox and Puragogy are the ones that kind of came up. And, um, but just even within one organization, how, how are we communicating actually? How, what are the chat? You know, what's, where's the interoperability also in terms of basic, basic uh, should be basic collaboration around a, a newsletter announcement, for example. So just want to mention that. So you just brought me back to the actual originating sparking thought of, of suggesting bootstrapping ourselves, which was um, how might we actually use our own tools and improve them in doing what we're doing. And some of you <clears throat> um, have been taking our calls and transcribing them annotating them. Uh, Max is not on the call, but shifting them off, you know, programming some, some of it and moving it into Miro and modeling the conversation flow and doing a bunch of other things. Um, that's, that's like fantastic. And it, it, it's, it's one of many kinds of instances of what we could and might be doing. Um, during the, the check-ins, I was busy looking for stuff in my brain, but all I was doing was putting links to that node <clears throat> in the chat, which feels like so impoverished to me. It's like, how, how, do, we, how do we up our conversation um, how, how do we maybe improve the platform that we're in? <clears throat> maybe we should be in, in uh, Kiko uh, chat because then we could share documents better. I don't know, that, that doesn't feel like enough. But, but how can we sort of up our own game uh, using more of our tools to remember and share what we do? And then when we have really good ideas, how do we break them up and share them out? And so back to, Joe, back to you and, and the Piragaji new, uh, new release, the handbook. Um, I'm wondering what, what formats is being released in? Is it released openly? Because I know Howard, I've known Howard a long time and I'm assuming a lot of it is very open sourcey. Um, and how to make a handbook, because I love field manuals and handbooks, they're like handy. Um, how to make it extremely useful for use, how, how to make it, at, how to leave it at hand for people who want to use the wisdom that's lodged in it. And here I'll point to a, a, a book series that came up in earlier calls. Uh, when Ann Pendleton Julian was with us. And I'm a little frustrated that there's a, 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 this incredible heap of great thinking stuck in books that Ann and, and JSB, John C. Lee Brown, have co authored, and they're trapped on dead trees. And, and I'm like, how do we release these and make them not just available as text on a web page, which is a great leap forward, but as an app that folds into our platform that we can then just use, right? Yeah, so this is like the question that I think I've been thinking about probably the most for 20 years or so. Uh, I started thinking about it when I was a PhD student in mathematics. And I, I basically at that time thought, you know, none of these mathematicians are giving attention to optimizing the way they're teaching mathematics. If they were, they wouldn't be such horrible teachers, right? Um, 
And so I thought, well, why don't I do something different, which would be uh, use computers to optimize the teaching of mathematics. And then I had this thought about AI, thinking if we really optimized it with AI, then maybe we're at a different, we're doing something different even from mathematics now. So obviously I parted ways with them um, at some point. Um, but uh, yeah, I think uh, that question, I mean, just to concretely answer your question in, in the concrete terms about the Pure Guide Handbook. So, it is all available open source, not just open source. It's like the most open format that I can think of. Uh, it's available in the public domain. So if you, for example, want to take it, download it, stick your name on it, put it through Lightning Source and sell it on Amazon, you're more than welcome to do that. Um, anyone here can do that. Um, you can use it in your lectures. You can translate it into Spanish. You can you know, do whatever you want with it. Now, that's a little bit objectionable to some people who think it should be copy left. They haven't convinced me that it should should not be public domain yet, but they object, but so what, they object. Um, so there it is, but yeah, what you're talking about though is not just the open license or being digitally readable or public domain, it's actually the practical side of it. And in the software world, that comes with something called like literate programming. And again, this is something that came up yesterday in my startup discussion, like, um, instructions how how literate is literate if there's a bunch of exposition explaining how to how to do it or how to use it is it actually enough and i, I think that that question like how do you create a how-to handbook is interesting then the other one that makes it even more interesting in the context of pure guys is we want to be a how-to handbook but we don't want to be prescriptive which is a really weird contradictory thing to have to walk right like how do you create something that's very open and at the same time, very practical. Um, you know, so like a, a, a catechism is not open, but it is somehow practical, right? So uh, that's we're, we're it's, it's an interesting space. So I will leave it there because we haven't solved that problem yet. But so those dilemmas are central to what we're what our inquiry is here. And I think I, I would love us to, to sort of keep looking back at the, that set of dilemmas you're describing. That's a, a really nice collection, you know. And 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 one and Charles, I'll go to you in just a sec. I woke up at four a.m. this morning, sort of troubled about my mom, unable to sleep. But then I started thinking about a bunch of the stuff that I've created, and how I've sort of been limited by trying to pour it into like a book form. And I haven't published a book and all that, but I have zillions of, of snippets of stuff. Some of which I like. I've done. A, I just realized I've done a whole video series that I never really actually sort of published or or made public. So there, there's a, a series of unlisted videos that I didn't do, and then I realized why don't I just weave these out in the, in the open context and then make this an OGM-ish kind of thing and f try to figure out how these ideas connect and how to make them useful and all of that. So, so I had my own sort of project that, that fits in the, in the middle of all this uh, about trust. Um, Charles. I just, uh, before we got too far further, I just wanted to go back and touch on, you, you mentioned something about upping our game and, and you were referring to um, getting the, links from your brain and what, what Pete and, and others do, Pete especially deserves uh, big props for, for sharing all the links and, and he does that like always in all the different calls. Um, and this is amazing and it's also an amazing superpower that, that, that some of us are blessed with, but it's a kind of blessing and a curse to do that in real time, to kind of literally bifurcate this like incredible value of, of the synchronous um, you know, resonance and, and of the interaction. And so I, I, I just wanted to underscore that I think part of the upping of the game is to, to, to kind of lighten that load so that we're actually, you know, freeing most of our energy um, to, to kind of being resonant in the synchronous mode. But that's still incredibly valuable. I don't have a, any more answer to that. But. Well, I'm, re I'm really interested in how each of us can apply those things that we seem to be sort of gifted to do in a, in a way that blends and intersects and interacts that doesn't overwhelm everybody, but rather enriches this, this common, common thing we're doing. Um, and uh, some of you have heard me talk about farmer leaf cutter ants. Uh, as, a, as an analogy for, there's a lot of nice biological analogies for what OGM is doing, <clears throat> but leaf cutter ants don't eat leaves. Like they can't digest or metabolize leaves. So why are they out there in trees cutting down leaves? Because they bring the leaves down into, the, into their nest. Uh, they hand them off to the, basically the, the, the fungus tender farmer ants. They're also known as farmer ants, who then mulch up, mulch up the leaves, they're put their spit and the leaves onto a fungus that they're busy symbiotically um, growing. Uh, in, in their nest, and everybody feeds off the nectar that that fungus basically 
creates. So that's what they're all eating. So, so there's this gigantic collaborative task that leads to uh, a thriving hive and lots of nutrition for everybody uh, that involves series of, you know, a series of systems and, and symbiotic relationships, including, for example, they did, they did chemical samples of the dust on the, on the thorax of the ants that are right at the fungus face. And it turns out that there's nat natural anti antibacterials that are on the ants that are trying to keep the fungus from getting infected by you know, opportunistic infections. That all of that, all of that sort of stuff is happening in, in, in lots and lots of layers. So I, I see OGM as kind of we're we're like smarter termites who are busy um, trying to figure out how to feed the fungus and live off it together uh, in in a in a, in, a, in a way that makes the soil healthier. Just to take it back to to Klaus and Kevin and regenerative processes, because those principles are the heart of what we're thinking about. Charles then Doug, then Doug. You triggered just one more thought, which I thought, you, and then you set me up very well for sharing it, which is something like um, this thriving hive image from the from the leaf cutter ants um, <clears throat> point, points to very specifically, like what are all the other ants doing? Um, um, and so what are us here in, in the synchronous and also in the asynchronous in, in discourse and in the forum and so forth and amongst our, our various sub conversations um, doing in those various ways and forms um, but but back to the the kind of the moment of now in a Zoom call, like with all these links flying in the chat. Personally, the the best way that I have managed to, to to deal with it, and some of you have heard about this, is just to grab them, put them into my mind map, which is where I take my notes, and kind of literally interweave and interleave um, the chats uh, with the links into the conversation notes, um, and at least you get them interwoven with with this um, the kind of time stamping. And, and so on. So anyway, just wanted to share that. Thank you. And I think the, the nugget size is what I call this is really interesting and important. Like is, is a nugget, a, a unit, uh, is it a book size? Is it a tweet? Is it a chapter? Is it an, a thought? It, it, like, like what is that? And that, that's kind of a, an interesting philosophical and design question we need to dive into later. Doug? Well, this is kind of naive, but it just starts from my experience sitting here. I wish I could click on each person's picture and get a statement of who they are and what's most on their mind. And then I could rearrange the squares with the people I'm most interested in at the top. So everybody who's in the community would have a picture, even if it's a thousand. If I could rearrange them, uh, that would be terrific. And then down the right hand side would be a list of topics or themes. Uh, those two together would give me quite a sense of power, uh, personal power in manipulating into the space. So at the top of the call, I think it was Scott who mentioned the now pages slash now. <clears throat> and so I borrowed this from Derek Sivers and at the bottom of my every email, I, I, my signature is now slash now, which is a link to my now page where I've made the effort to say this is what I'm working on. Although I'm realizing I haven't refreshed it in a while and it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't put OGM high enough because this is really the center of my, my, my passion. Um, and if we were then to take those pages, tag them up, remix them and make them available through metadata. And then if, and only if zoom were able to process some of that information, you could in fact see yourself around people you want to talk to during an event. I'm just playing for playing forward your fantasy, your fantasy vision, but it, it's, it's like a simple matter of programming. Right. And, and by the way, um, somebody just mentioned Weaver, right? Um, so, the, uh, oh, sorry, Weaver was for profiles. Yeah, but, but um, I'm thinking here of the uh, W, um, what is the WebRT? Yeah, we, we, uh, WebRT, I think it is the, the video protocol on the web. There's a whole bunch of Zoom-like <clears throat> systems that don't cost very much money because they're basically using uh, WebRT. What is Pete, what's it called? WebRT? Yeah, WebRTC, thank you. Um, they're busy using that, but we could code a workalike um, that does some of this sort of stuff, and in fact has as its algorithm for how it presents people to each each person, like hey, here's people, and we could make it really easy to exchange contact to say hey, you know, are you a trusted person? Uh, you look like somebody I'd love to talk to. That means you swap information on, automatically. We could prototype something like that. That's, and, and that could fit into Piragaji because it could implement some of the rules of Piragaji. And there's, <clears throat> if we can get into a play space where we can start figuring out some of these things, and we do have a few coders in the room, 
um, I think these things would be really interesting to mock up and experiment with. Go ahead, Scott. Um, just really quickly, this equates to my experience with online dating in the best possible way. Because <laughs> what happened was the best, the best sites that I was on at the time had attributes and interests before they had images. And so it was, it just was perfect. And I'm, ex I'm very happy right now um, because of that. And I think it addresses a whole problem that we have. And I think I, I could definitely see that because as Doug is saying, we do select people based on connection and having that list of, of topics and interests in people and then being able to move them to the top. I think that's, it's just such a great way to approach people. Love that. Um, so in the interest of bootstrapping, I'm curious, what do we in OGM need to do to get some experiments like that up in front of ourselves? How do we, do we need to fund some coders? Do we need to just collect together some coders to say, hey, how about this, et cetera? Lauren. It's there somewhere. There you go. And your voice is slow getting to us again. Can you hear me? Yes, now we hear you. It's very weird. Okay. So I keep kind of saying this, but I really do think the easiest way to jump in is just to, uh, you know, start with a client, just someone in our network who's really important, has like a, you know, media connection, like someone who has like a lot of sway that we can bring in, ideate on whatever interests them especially if it's something fun that we like to do too, like talk about the election or something like that and just throw down in terms of like very quickly, just like how, how do we do this? Bing, 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 bing. And then actually like come up with something. It's good for them because they get like free ideation on that's amazingly high quality. It's really good for us. So we can start seeing what do we actually do when we do something together? Who does what? Who's good at what here? Um, when we actually work, who's good at what things? And then from there, we can start giving each other uh, recommendations like the, the video I did for you, Jerry. We can do that for each other and start building up like a professional portfolio. So it's like each week we can really start building stuff. And then after just one week, we'll have a client that we can say this is a client of OGM and brag about you know our client. We can make we can start making demos from that to show to put on PowerPoints and but it just moves us along at a really fast pace, I think. And then we'll know exactly what we need to code to make the process um, smoother. To make it work. And and um, I think clients would be great. And I've got six different conversations I'm in, any one of which could turn into a project that will employ some OGMers or that will, or my, kind of my preference, that will pour some money into a vat that we can distribute among OGM fellows or something like that, among people who are contributing a lot to OGM. So that would be great. I'm very leery of the wrong clients because one of the problems with Media Lab at, at MIT was that its sponsors were basically the major media companies. And so for how many decades, you know, Negroponte and the Media Lab have been around, we don't have a lot to show for it because they were constrained by their sponsors, by, by like, partly they were trying to reinvent industries, but they were trying to reinvent them from a profitability perspective. I'm overgeneralizing. There is the Epstein problem as well. Um, but, but they had problems before, you know, Epstein showed up. There was just a, a, a grounding problem in how they were motivated or framed to go after problems. Um, and no, when, but I don't think we need to do it from that just by the profitability perspective. I think that we can focus on um, ideating and actually mm. like, producing memes. Like, how do we produce? Like, you and April have been talking about this concept of there are all these things that we don't have words for, so we can't talk about it. And that, like, like the like the Trump thing, the thing he, the magical thing he does, that yeah. um, force that he does, like, oh, Joe Biden didn't follow up on, you know, this, it, it's really hard to talk about without coming up with these meta concepts. And that's what we can do. And I just think having a partner that can actually get the word out and 
um, you know, writing about this in an editorial or, you know, it could be anyone who has a large audience. Okay. But right. something where we actually make something that's distributed to other people who can digest it. Would I like inspire that. us, I think. I like that. Um, other thoughts? We're at the we're at the ninety minute mark. We should start to wrap this call. Any concluding thoughts? This felt like a bootstrappy conversation, for what it's worth. I, I I feel like there was a lot of sharing of how we think about this. Mark, please. Yeah, yeah. I I, I want to uh, take on what Lauren was uh, um, saying earlier about taking one client. So. The collectives that uh, that have been forming um, is with um, indigenous allies. So what what we decided to do is um, that every member of that collective will take one of its project and um, basically structure it like a model. So from that, you know, comparatively with you know five, six, seven projects, we hope to achieve a best practice a model with, you know, how to best work with indigenous people. You know, that's an idea for start to, that we do. And thank you, Mark. And you're reminding me that one of the most useful things we might do as a group as part of bootstrapping is to serve communities that could really use our help. Um, and then second thought along those lines is the conversation with indigenous populations around the world has to be handled with great care, with great care, <coughs> care excuse me, um, in part because the last 10 scientists and media people who showed up basically screwed up their world worse than it was. Um, so there's, there's like no, no particular reason for most of these communities to trust outsiders, uh, et cetera, et cetera. There's, a, there's kind of a long list of issues, but still I think that's one of the, one of the most interesting and important things we can do um, is be of service, be of help to those communities. And I, have a very naive understanding of what that even means. So, so opening that conversation and deepening it, I think, is a would be a really useful thing. Uh, Charles, go ahead. Um, just wanted to prompt you, Mark, if if you might um, share something. To, to, we we share we share a number of other groups, and and going back, um, I guess it was last year, uh, the Beyond Us, and now the, the Metamorphosis group is a Facebook group some of you know and are part of, and, and with, with a lot of um, uh, discussion and, and um, sharing and content around indigenous stuff. Um, we also had um, quite a wonderful um, talk with Tom Atley about, about this as well. Um, so I, I think I just wanted to highlight those things, and, and Mark, I don't know if you wanted to comment any further, if, if there's anything that comes to mind in the, at the end of this call here maybe an invitation to metamorphosis, which I've, I've just uh, come on as a moderator as well. Um, well, I think, I think I mentioned, you know, uh, one of the uh, last times we were all together here um, that I st started, but I put it on a pause, but what I, something that I call indigenous voices that I started with now what six months ago, and I'm going to restart it with the next now what, um, uh, with Ben Roberts. Um, so just, just gathering indigenous people and have them share, you know, their views on, on, on some topics. And the first ones was about uh, mostly uh, bringing down some of the perceptions that we have about indigenous people and we tend either to romanticize them or idealize them. And, and, and that's really not helpful to paint the pictures of indigenous people as noble savages, um, which is really, you know, again, you know, colonialism at, at its worst. Um, so it's, it's really, to, for me, it's, um, it's really to get them into, into conversation. And that was the uh, third, third um, um, talks that I organized with them. Um, so it's, it's being inclusive and thinking like, you know, like when I read the title of the book, Low Tech, uh, Traditional Econo Ecological Knowledge, um, that doesn't mean anything in itself. It, it, it has to be contextualized. And it, you know, when you go into a tribe, and they don't talk about ecology. They, they talk about the living system. They talk about, uh, um, 
what do they need to maintain the systems and and stay alive basically so once once you come from that point uh you you you, you have a very different and more interesting conversations i think thank you i love that that's a great perspective I think it may be time to ring the bell uh, on this call. I genuinely, deeply appreciate your being here. And uh, let's build more stuff online and see you in a week. Yeah. All right. Best wishes for dealing with your mother, Jerry. Thank you all. Thank you very much. I appreciate that a lot.